um, thank you very much for the invitation to speak today um, in the second Antronix meeting, which is nicely dedicated to redox oil batteries, which is my area. Um, I'm going to rather broadly speak about redox oil battery electrolytes today, um, and I've gone for a ridiculous title as ever, um, and the good, the bad and the radical, but we will see if I can get through that. There's a lot of electrolytes to consider in, in redox oil batteries, and I don't want to just list off everything, although it might feel that way to begin with, um, but I will at first, just sort of give the broader scope of where redox oil batteries are in terms of their different electrolytes, because the electrolytes the the critical component of a redox oil battery really that distinguishes one from the, the other. And um, and then I will go into a bit of my own research, which covers some aspect, a very small niche area of uh, redox oil battery electrolytes. So what is a redox oil battery? Um, well, it sits, it, they're different to normal batteries in that we're looking at a system that's a continuous process rather than a batch battery system. So we're, we're used to conventional um, batteries which have all that intrinsic energy storage on the electrodes themselves. So the electrodes are part of, of that um, electrochemical storage and it's a solid material typically at that electrode material, at the electrode surface. In a redox flow battery, instead, what we have. Um, are electrodes which are sort of agents of electrons coming in and out of the system, but they're not intrinsically part of that energy storage. Instead, we have something that's more akin to an electrolyzer and a fuel cell combined, so a regenerative fuel cell, essentially. Where you have an electrolyzer, we're typical, uh, we're used to electrolyzers which split water, so we have um, that irreversible process of water having electricity um, thrown into it such that we then convert um, we split that water into its constituent parts, hydrogen and oxygen, and then we can store that hydrogen as a fuel for later on. So that's electrical, electrical energy converting into chemical energy. And then on the other side, we have that fuel cell where we can then recombine that hydrogen and oxygen in a very clever, contrived way um, across a different kind of electrode system um, with a special kind of membrane material which then allows us to recombine that hydrogen and oxygen um, and reclaim that en electrical energy that we put in with a lot of efficiency losses. There's efficiencies um, lost here because this irreversible process with electrolysis um, imparts a lot of um, losses due to the kinetic losses. And we also have um, corresponding losses for the fuel cell. So a regenerative hydrogen fuel cell is quite a, an inefficient process, about 30% in its round trip efficiency. But we could also use that same concept in a flow battery where we have a reversible process, um, although don't tell an electrochemist that all these processes are reversible because they're not typically on the electrochemical uh, spectrum. But in terms of comparing it to a hydrogen uh, splitting or, or water splitting to hydrogen and oxygen, they are reversible processes. And the, the idea is that you keep in a pure redox oil battery anyway, that you have all your species dissolved in solution and then you apply electricity and on one side you will have a species that is being um, reduced to a storage solution which is a negative uh, solution relative to the other tank which is then your positive solution where the species is being oxidized simultaneously and then you've got a storage space um, for those charged species and that's where we see the, the main difference in our redox oil battery is that we've got our powerhouse where our, our systems are charged and then discharged as well so you just cycle back those same solutions and thermodynamically you derive um, the, the electricity that was stored that was stored when charging of those solutions um, but you have your powerhouse in the middle and then you have your storage tanks separate and those storage tanks can be of whatever size um, you need. So we've decoupled our system and that gives us, I'm going to just run through some of the terminology you might encounter today or tomorrow if you're attending tomorrow in our flow battery meeting. Um, we will see lots of terminology in this space. So essentially you'll see this structure happening again and again where you have your electrochemical cell in the middle, you have your two electrodes, typically carbon electrodes, they might be flow, um, flow through systems or, you, or ones where you just fly, go over, the, over the, um, the electrodes instead, or it might be a porous material that you that be the solutions pass through. But there's a conductive carbon material here 
and a membrane separating each half. This is the classic system that there are so many iterations. So I know that there's going to be people looking at different types, but this is your classic flow battery. And on your negative side, you have what we call the negolite for simplicity, because that's relatively the more negative solution. And then on your positive side, the species that oxidizes when charging, that's going to be your more positive solutions. We call that the posilite in these horrible terms. Other people call those the analyte and the catholite respectively. And you can go between these. So the cath and the, the catholite and analyte re re reflect the discharging process. So when we discharge the battery, your, ca your cathodic process is happening on the positive side and your anodic process is happening on the on the negative side. So this is where these terms all come from. But generally, this is your generic sort of flow battery system for a pure flow battery. Now, one of the main selling points of a redux flow battery, like I said already, is that you have um, decoupled power and energy. So your conventional battery is a closed cell system. It has everything contained within that cell. So your electrodes and everything, is con all the energy materials, all the membranes, everything's contained within that single cell. And the electrodes are part of, of that electrochemical storage process. Um, and that could be reversible or it could be irreversible. You can have a primary battery where you have a single use function or you can have a reversible system like a lithium ion intercalation battery or a lead or a lead acid battery. In a redox flow battery, like I said, you've got your, your powerhouse, the bit where the charging and discharging happens, and then you've got your external storage tanks for those, for those materials that have been charged or discharged or in whatever state of charge they are. Um, and when you're looking at the advantages and disadvantages of these two systems, this is where they really come into play. Uh, so if I wanted to store one hour of energy, I think like say one big cell, I can store an hour's worth of energy and my battery, my redox or battery then would need, you know, storage tanks appropriate to storing one hour's worth of um, electricity, depending on the rate at which you can discharge. But then when I want to scale up to a more long duration storage system or multiple hours, usually four hours plus, then this is where it gets interesting for flow batteries, because in a closed cell system like lithium ion or lead acid, that means scaling up every single one of those closed cells. Um, and that means every part of the whole system needs to be scaled accordingly. So you're scaling all those electric materials, all the separators, all the casing, everything needs to be scaled up. And you're correspondingly scaling up your power as well, because all of those have their own voltage um, that they're contributing to the system. Um, so the, the, the degree at which you need to scale up is much more significant compared to a redox flow battery, where if you now want to just store more energy, but not necessarily deliver more power, you don't need to change your central module. You don't need to change your stack in the middle where all your cells are. You merely need to increase that volume of your electrolyte. Um, and then uh, you can just scale that to, to whatever system you want. So that's why we, we look at the, the pure redox cell battery as being a decoupled system um, and, and why it's particularly favored for long duration energy storage. So the flagship system, just to give it more context here, and again, I've just reiterated all the posilite and like uh, in the system, is the all vanadium redox flow battery. This is the one that was developed in the 1980s, and this is the one that's taken off as, as the main uh, commercially available redox flow system that you will encounter presently. Um, so in the 1980s, after a lot of tinkering around with the, the concept of redox flow battery throughout the, the 20th century, really, um, there was a breakthrough with the vanadium system. And the vanadium is unique in that we've got four oxidation states for vanadium that are stable in acid solutions. So you've got uh, two, three, four and five that are all stable um, species to a, a relatively high concentration of around two molar um, in sulfuric acid especially if you have additives and so on, which they do nowadays. And what we see is that in our negative solution, we're going to oscillate between uh, the vanadium-2 and the vanadium-3 species. So that's our relatively more negative solution. And we're going to, on the positive side, we're seeing an oscillation between the vanadium-4 and the vanadium-5 species. This is what I mean about them not being really reversible systems. This is not an electrochemically reversible couple. But... In terms of how it works in a flow battery, it's considered a reversible system. 
but we just have uh, the, the vanadium is a beautiful one because it's also got a nice colour change. So we can see the vanadium, the purple vanadium two system being formed at the same time as that yellow vanadium five um, charged solution being made. So you've got a columnetic of method of, of design uh, or working out whether the system's charged or discharged, as well as the power based one. Um, so this is your state of the art and it's simplified. And one of the reasons it's worked so well is not only just because it, it's simply, you know, the metal ion dissolved in acid. There's not a big synthetic process involved. But additionally, you've got vanadium across the whole system. So this is what we call a symmetric cell, where you've got the same constituent species across the whole cell. And that gives you fewer constraints on this membrane because the membrane, what we want to avoid is sort of metal crossover through this membrane back and forth. Um, which would essentially self-discharge the battery. But if we get men if we get vanadium crossover through one side or the other, then it all sort of equalizes out. Yes, there's a disparity, slight disparity in the oxidation state, but it still works out for it um, to stabilize. So we don't get contamination in the battery as such. There are other issues, however. So the vanadium flow battery, um, in terms of it being um, the state of the art really it, this is the this is the benchmark for where our systems that we're developing now um, need to, to compete really and, and it has the advantage of having that independent power and capacity um, because of the, the style everything's dissolved, dissolved in solution it has uh, the offer of that long duration energy storage and it's also something that isn't affected by partial um, charge states and it's not affected by by having small boosts of charging suddenly going back to discharging or being left in a resting state. It's something that's very flexible and adaptable to um, unpredictable bursts of energy and, and extractions of energy, as you would expect on a, on a grid based system. Um, typically, yeah, the species are typically they're reversible and they're stable in their charge states, which is really critical. Um, and then because all the processes are happening in the solution phase, so you're, you're charging the solution phase loop species and nothing to do with the electrode as such. The electrode, like I said, is just an agent in the process. That means that you have you have inert electrodes and and um, and the solvent itself is in it as well um, in that it's just sulfuric acid. So you, you, you're not uh, losing uh, efficiency or capacity or or, um, or changing the properties of the solution. Um, and that means you end up with a really extended lifetime. So because there are no significant phase changes of going to you know, gas phase or going to the solid phase, which is particularly destructive, um, you have what um, possibly more than 20 years of cycling back and forth available without, without damaging or reducing the efficiency of the battery. It sounds fantastic, but there are disadvantages too. So you can see one of the main issues with a redox or battery, and this is going to be across the board, is that you've got a solute and a solvent. And once you move to a solute and a solvent system, you're looking at low energy density uh, intrinsically because you've got this expensive, heavy, um, not expensive necessarily, but you've got this heavy solvent that is also part of your redox, of your energy density as well. So you're limited in how much um, energy density you get by how much solute you can get into that solvent um, effectively. And that's inherently going to make this system a low energy density. But if you're looking at long duration storage, it's not necessarily a problem because you're looking at a large scale system anyway. So these aren't going to be driving any cars anytime soon. They're not designed for power and they're not designed for um, for small scale, but they are. Um, but if you're looking at long a large scale system, then the energy density becomes less of an issue. Um, one of the issues is expensive electrolytes. So the vanadium itself is con controversially, is it expensive, is it not? One day you hear one thing, one day you hear the next. Um, it, it's up and down, it's fluctuating. There are more mines and there are more dedicated um, uh, sources of vanadium now. So that's also reducing the cost of vanadium generally in the scene. But, they're still considered a, a highly expensive um, material. And then even more crucially is the expensive membrane materials that are required in all the flow batteries. They account for a large proportion, at least a fifth, if not a quarter of the percent of the of the um, cost of a redox flow battery. And then, they, of course, they have this high capital cost that we see. But then the high capital cost 
everything's got a high capital cost, but if you're looking at 20 years of lifetime, then you need to start looking at the levelized cost and the cost over per cycle and the cost over the lifetime of that system. Now, I've mentioned in some of my uh, statements there that we have a pure redox low battery. So a pure redox low battery is, so there are multiple types of flow battery within this frame. Uh, the pure flow battery is your one way all, all the species are in solution, uh, like that old vanadium flow battery. And that's, that's, that's the true flow battery. That's where everything is staying in solution and everything's coming from cycling around from solution. And that's your system that's going to be decoupled. Um, the other leading system in this space is the hybrid redox oil battery, and that's such as the zinc bromide battery. And the zinc bromide battery, or the all iron flow battery, there's a few different ones, involves the metal deposition on one half of the battery. So that's where you have zinc being deposited um, uh, on, on the negative side of the battery, such that the charge state is, is zinc metal and then a, a bromide complex on, on the positive side. Um, and that means you've now moved from being a decoupled system to a coupled system because your electrode is part of that of that battery system. So you're not going to have that advantage of a decoupled real cell battery, but you do have the advantage of considerably lower cost electrolytes, possibly. There are other systems which involve gas and flow. Now, gas and flow still uh, retains the title of a decoupled system because if you're generating, and one example is hydrogen bromine battery in this, Space, um, if you have um, an electrolyte, a liquid electrolyte, and then one of your storage solutions or so storage um, species becomes hydrogen gas, and then you're recycling that, recirculating that hydrogen gas into your system, then you can still decouple that. Same as with an electrolyzer generating hydrogen, and then you're storing that hydrogen separately. So, gas and flow systems are still considered. Um, to have that pure structure and then you've also got now emerging semi-solid material solid systems where you've got solid suspensions or polymer materials suspended in solution they're passing through um the flow battery as well uh, and then the storage they're part of that storage solution so the, the it's not stored in the solutions that is stored on the on this solid material but it's not necessarily a deposition process happening so these are all sorts of different types of redox load battery within this um, framework. And you can see there are so many more. So I'm not even going to begin to talk about all of these, but this is from a, a recent paper that came out this year, um, which is a nice summary of, of, of the perspectives of, of redox load batteries um, and where they're heading for 2030. So you can see the state of the art for flow batteries. You know, um, you're looking at uh, energy densities of around 30 watt hours per litre. And the current cost about 0.16 um, euros per kilowatt hour per cycle. Whereas the targets are a minimum of 10,000 cycles and the target is to try and um, drop that price per kilowatt hour per cycle um, down to 0.05 euros. So there's a huge cost objective to try and really make um, redox of batteries competitive, if not more competitive than, than lithium ion systems. And there's a whole host of developments that happened. So you've got your hybrid and your normal vanadium battery systems that came out in the 80s. And these continue to be developed and they are the most mature in this frame, uh, in this space. But then since the 2000s, especially since the 2010s, we've seen a whole host of new innovative designs coming out, new ideas, really um, interesting chemistries and, and really interesting changes in how we even con conceptualise redox oil batteries. Um, and this is things like metal air batteries, you've got your it, the organic redox oil batteries um, coming out, so both aqueous and non-aqueous systems really emerged in the 2010s where people are moving away from metal systems to metal-free systems and coming up with a whole host of species. And then, yeah, your solid, um, your semi-solid systems and your, your metal systems as well. Loads of different developments in this space heading towards um, those cost targets. Again, I've got some uh, of the established systems we've got here. 
These are all com all ex existing companies. There's over 32 companies globally working on vanadium batteries, for example. So we, this is a really established system uh, that is being developed, but it still has its problems. It's still not widespread and still not uh, mainstream in, in energy storage. So there's loads of developments to do here. Um, and they're largely related to bringing the costs down um, and trying to get the scale systems to have better efficiencies. Um, but generally, there's usually a boom and a bust with with flow battery uh, with vanadium flow battery systems where they get a big investment and then they seem to go bust shortly after. So there's a lot of trying to retain and 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 keep that market going and show that they are competitive with lithium ion batteries. And then you've got companies looking at zinc bromine. Lots of different zinc systems out there, but zinc bromine being the most successful. You can see the cost is actually not yet competitive with the vanadium system, despite zinc and bromine in themselves being low cost, the complexing agents for, for zinc bromine make it much more expensive. Um, and then one that's really exciting thing is the high is the all iron battery, which is where you're depositing iron on one side and you've got an iron com uh, an, an iron two three top uh, complex on the other side. Um, and this has really got a very cost competitive possibly it's really hard to, to compare these prices because you know you get a lot of hype from the companies but this looks particularly interesting as, as in terms of aspiring to this set of targets for cost and plan um, so we're just now looking at whether the lifetime and, and the life cycle of these systems will um, prevail and like I said there's a whole host of different zinc systems and flow batteries based on zinc but I won't dwell on that here um, what's really interesting in terms of if you're coming into this market, because so those are all your established systems, but there's a lot of new and emerging technology, as you saw in that other schematic, just short, uh, just briefly. Um, and we can see that even at the demonstration level already, that acres of organic redox or batteries are a huge market that are developing and they're already getting some grid demonstration. They're looking at kilowatt systems. They are doing things that um, we were seeing about 15 years ago with vanadium batteries and now Acris Organics have reached that point within um, within not even 10 years. So we're seeing huge development in Acris Organic redox or batteries um, in terms of developing um, new new electrolytes and new, new storage solutions. Um, and their advantage is it being metal free chemistry and therefore having that, that, uh, that attribute of, of essentially being mining resource free if you like and sustainable but they have a huge problem with long-term stability as i'll go into shortly and then you've got other met novel metal systems that are starting to come out and spin out so i mean there's this one in the uk called rfc spin out which is a hydrogen manganese battery we've got a soluble lead disc um, talk later on so i'm sure they'll go further into that um and like i said lots of different zinc based chemistries coming out as, as alternatives um for for what is mainstream and then even more exciting are the emerging technology. This is where I sort of remit is. And you've got solid active materials where we're really changing how that electrolyte's developed. We've got solid boosters, solid, solid like materials that, that are part of that electron exchange, that Faraday process in, in the solution. So you're charging up the electrodes and then exchanging with these solid materials in solution. And then your solid materials are retaining that. Um, that charge state for you and and so they, they it's still that pure flow battery in a sense but you're you've got more storage capacity and you can reach considerably higher even up to 12 molar solutions um when you're using it in, in conjunction with these solid materials um and then you've got non-aqueous organic flow batteries as well and non-aqueous metal organic flow batteries and lots of different complexes within the non-aqueous um space metal air batteries and then now as well membrane free systems because membranes are one of the intrinsic problems of redox or batteries going forward so then here some more chemicals so you can see just where the organic redox or battery world is it's typically biologens um crinoids and uh and nitroxide um radical systems so the tempo typically and we see lots of these um, materials coming out into that research space and pyridines as well. I've got pyridines on here, but pyridines as well are very much what the Jenner battery is looking at in, in the space of working to try and make um, organic redox or batteries in an aqueous environment. And then you've got a whole host of materials being 
produced, been synthesized, been explored, been examined now in non-aqueous non redox soil batteries as well. And typically these um, organic species form radicals and the radicals mean that they're going to have possibly temperamental stability when they're in their charged states. And, and But that's pretty much what's going to happen if you move towards a metal-free system, is that that charge state, that radical state doesn't get um, sort of taken on board by the metal center. So we've got lots of different species, but then radicals don't just mean that you're going to have a, um, a, a reactive system. It means you, you're going to have some kind of, um, uh, you're going to have different kinds of radical states. So the tempo, for example, in the PTIO, these are really, really stable radical systems and, and they actually stay very stable and in their charge state as well. So these neutral radicals are actually considerably more stable than these, and, uh, these ionic radicals. But that is still something that's being explored in this field. So there's a whole host anyway of different electrolytes and I'm worried I'm just rambling on about and giving you a big stream of all the possibilities of where people are working and I'm going to go try and go back to this didactic model now and explain um, the rationale between why we're trying to play with our electrolytes specifically. Now electrolytes in a redox fill battery are your main, they're, they're, they're the, the pinnacle, they're the centre, the reason why um, the flow battery works, they're critical to the functionality, they're critical to the, the voltage that you're going to see, they're critical to the long-term efficiency and the stability, and then essentially the energy density of the system as well. And it all comes down to Faraday's laws of electrolysis. So this is Faraday, this, this equation is the one that you need to really have the heart of any kind of battery research that you're doing. Um, and this is for the capacity in the first instance here, and it's essentially the capacity of battery depends on the number of electrons that are involved in your charge discharge process. And moles of electroactive species that you have, and then you've got that multiplied by Faraday's constant and the time constant here, which is uh, 3,600 seconds per hour to give you that amp power unit. And that gives you a quantity of how much energy you have in an hour um, of having your material. And now for a pure redox cell battery, we swap out the number of moles for concentration times volume and we have our energy density or our capacity with respect to um, the, the, the volume. But also in a pure redox cell battery, we divide the whole system by two because we have a symmetric, we have two volumes of electrolyte, if you like. So it's um, when in solid state batteries, you've got one material going to be transferring over to the other. So it's the whole equation you can work out. Um, but with a flow battery, with a pure flow battery, you need to divide the whole thing by two because you've got two quantities of volume of, of species counteracting each other. Um, and then the solid state equation that you might be more familiar with, you, you typically end up with units of milliamp hours per gram. And that's again, that's just um, converting your moles here into mass over MR and taking that mass over to the other side to give you the units per gram. Um, and you can just get the energy, sorry, that's always the capacity, for the energy of the system then is that same equation multiplied by the cell voltage um, and, and the, vol the open circuit voltage of your system. So you chew your negolite and your catalyte against each other and so we just put that back into there and we end up with what hours per litre for a pure redox of battery, we end up what hours per kilogram for a solid state battery, we convert this one into kilograms if we know the density of the solution um, and so we can make it relatable. But the key thing here isn't necessarily how those equations drive, but this is the critical equation when you're working out whether you want to, what the energy density of your electrolyte is going to be and how you're going to manipulate that solution to try and give you the maximum value of energy density as you can get. Because that's your main goal initially, is to try and get a really high energy density solution. Um, and you can see that they're all linearly related to the, the number of electrons that are going to be transferred, the concentration of active species and that cell voltage. So these are areas that you can start to then intelligently try to design and enter your system to actually give them and impart some um, some volt, uh, some particular parameters. And we can see I'm running out of time, big time. I'm really bad at running that, keeping this time. Um, we, we can also look, we also need to consider not just what our redox species are doing, but also in what solvent they're operating. So you can see if we're working in a water solution, um, when we're in an aqueous solution, we're looking at, uh, you know, the vanadium battery. This is a thermodynamic 
window that you have for, for water, but of course your kinetic window being a lot higher, so you've got thermodynamic region stability, and then you've got a slightly higher kinetic stability window um, to operate within, so about two volts really. But you're competing with those solution uh, reactions as well. So whenever you're trying to work out what solution to do your, uh, what solvent to work in for your electrolyte, you need to consider that you're not competing with the reactions of the solvent and the salt as well. So aqueous flow batteries are quite confined to two, a two volt window, but really they're reconfined even less sometimes because we want to avoid hydrogen evolution and we want to avoid oxygen evolution in the battery as well. So it really restricts um, where you can operate with in, um, in, a, in an aqueous battery. Whereas compared to a solvent, you can really extend that voltage window out um, because now you've got a much wider operating voltage. So moving into a non-aqueous electrolyte allows you to think about redox couples that are happening um, outside uh, in a much wider voltage range. So immediately you're able to extend your cell potential hugely and therefore directly impact your, um, your energy density in that way. And then if you can it's also go to multiple electron transfers happening either on the reductive or oxidative side, then you can also get an increase in the number of electrons transferred by having a multiple electron transfer system. Um, again, happening, happening in a high voltage. So you can have a really big impact on your energy density by, by working out on materials that operate in this, in this um, solvent or can operate on a multiple electron transfer process. I won't go into asymmetry and symmetry. Um, so I'm just going to quickly, super quickly, uh, talk about these um, three topics. So this is where my research group works. So we, we work specifically at trying to control those parameters and we try and see if we can manipulate and make materials, make redox active materials that have particular properties that make the, that energy density grow. So can we increase the cell voltage um, selectively? Can we increase, uh, can we... Um, can we improve the solubility? Can we improve lots of different aspects that we try and increase that energy density of our system? And so a lot of our stuff has been done in non-aqueous, sort of or pretty much all our stuff's been done in non-aqueous solvents. Uh, and we've looked at metal organic uh, complexes with mixed ligand systems. So we were manipulating the ligands. We've looked at organic, um, all organic metal free species um, in, in a non-aqueous solvent. And we've also looked at the the impact of having a non innocent ligand on our metal centre. Um, so one aspect was tunable redox properties. So can you uh, improve your um, your battery by having um, a solution where you can uh, modify this ligand such that you then increase the potential difference between your redox species? So oh, I, I did skip the slide, but it was about symmetric batteries. Um, I can see Peter there now. I don't think he's there to yeah, remind me. Sorry so, to interrupt. Oh. <laughs> we have to, uh, uh, less than five minutes to round up. Okay, I'm going to skip my own research then. And I'm going to just show you, we looked at a load of these things. Essentially, what we found is that you need to um, be able to, while your voltammetry might look fantastic, and you can see we get lovely reversible voltammetry for these species. So you think, all right, I can have a battery where I have this system against this system, and I can improve the voltage window and the separation of these two things, and increase my energy density that way, and get a bigger energy difference between here. I can't improve, uh, also improve the solubility of the battery. I can get a massive increase in what my energy density is going to be on my on my solution of my species by just making these tweaks to the actual engineering of those cells of those um, molecules. And um, that looks really good in terms of the voltammetry and then the outcome and the solubility. But then when you in practice try and put it into a flow cell, you'll find that you're, you've got unstable um, species when you're being charged. And this is the case we used it. We did these, um, we made these complexes here with malonitrile ligand. They all look great on cyclic voltammetry, but when you put them in full cell cycling, you see we get a massive decay. So what we've started to do in the group is explore the stability and the lifetime of these species when they're negative or positive state. And what we found for this vanadium complex, for example, is that when, when we looked at the, the stability of the just this species cycling on its own, we've got a very nice stable um, couple compared to when we're looking at this species where we see that decay. So that decay is largely driven by this loss um, because this positive species is unstable. Um, and we had that 
Well, we, we verified that using UV Viz, where we saw that the um, the positive solution was going back to its um, it's reverting back to its original state after being charged. So while things look good on on the voltammetric scale, they don't necessarily last and persist when you're going into a, into a flow cell system. But being able to evaluate that effectively is really challenging. Same with the carbonate violet. We had this lovely voltammetry where we had some a nice one point eight two volt difference between our species here, um, but they were going to two radical states when we were charging, and we had some nice looking energy densities that were competitive with with um, a vanadium flow battery. But the cell, the full cell cycles um, completely deteriorate, and that's because, um, well, one of our, the uh, croc 2, 3, and the, the trianion radical is unstable when it's in its charge state completely compared to this other radical, which is very stable. So this is one thing where I say some radicals are stable and some are not. So it's, it's really hard, and you have to really investigate the long-term stability of your species throughout when you're, you're managing it. And even when you couple them with another complex, we still see this decay. So there's a lot of work. So to evaluate electrolytes, I'll just give you some tips. You need the right tools. So when we were looking at um, the, uh, the the mixed ligand systems, for example, we initially started with this really rubbish flow cell. We thought, well, flow cell just needs a plate and a, and a charging solution and chuck, chuck some um, electrons in, it'll be fine. But it was really, really hard. And we found we had really high resistances and we had really high, um, oh, but lots of problems with the solution generally. Um, and we could barely reach 12 cycles and it took such a long time because the energy density for the charge density was really low. And so when we really upgraded, thanks to this paper here, we upgraded our flow cell systems, we were again able to evaluate the same complexes, but now we were able to very easily access 100 cycles um, at a much higher charge density. And that was the, the, the flow cell being updated, not the chemistry. So in order to really evaluate your chemistry, your flow cells need to be really perfect, um, really set up for that kind of medium. Um, you also need the right membrane. And unfortunately for non-aqueous chemistry, and maybe um, you can comment on this, we don't have non-aqueous membranes at the moment. We just have, so what we keep using are these aqueous membranes in a non-aqueous environment. And you can imagine that's not very ideal. So there's a lot of the resistances that have been imparted in non-aqueous chemistries um, that haven't been overcome yet. And you also need the right experts to help you in the right spectrometers, because you need to be able to evaluate using EPR, using NMR, UV this, what's happening to your charged species when you charge them. So your electrolytes might look good on paper, they might look good on cyclic voltammetry, but they don't last. And we need to understand that decomposition process that's happening in, in our electrolytes. And then, of course, don't forget the price of these things. Um, your electrolyte isn't just the cost of the redox material, it's also the cost of the solvent, it's the cost of the supporting salt. So to be a competitively priced material, you need to consider all of these components and, and you know, when water is free and pretty much and the, and the sulfuric acid isn't costing much, you can see where non-aqueous has a disadvantage. So to conclude, <laughs> um, the good, the bad and the radical, I'm just saying like, I can't dictate which is the good, the bad and the radical of, of electrolytes. They're coming, the developments are incredible in, in what's happening in this space. It's really fast moving. Um, but typically you're going to need a high conductive, low uh, surface resistance solution, at least lower than 10, 5 ohms. And that might be related to your cell design as well as the solution being conductive. So there's, it's not just about the electrolytes here, it's about the design of the cell. Uh, you need a low cost and sustainable seats, uh, something, and then you need something that's got high solubility as well as this high charge retention in its in its charge state so the the long lifetime and it needs to stay stable um but when you're obviously the bad is the opposite of these but also you want to avoid co complex synthetic groups that are not going to be scalable you need to avoid reactive charge species um you you can't go for too low a cell potential because it outweighs the energy investment of charging the system so you, you've got a critical potential that you need to exceed which is about um 0.8 volts at least um, and then you need to consider the whole expense of your system so if you expect if your system demands a really expensive supporting salt it's going to be detrimental and then run out of time and then radicals exciting space don't don't discount radical systems they can have a lot of potential i have seen a three volt flow battery 
that's recently emerged. Um, and it's because of design strategies to stabilize the, these radical systems. So you can make very stable radical systems and you can make them at very high voltage. There could be a big future in um, in non aqueous batteries if we can if we can get really high voltage systems that outweigh the cost and expense of the solvents. OK, and I just want to acknowledge uh, these two guys, especially this my research group, uh, but Craig, who's done most of the work in this paper, in this whole um, presentation here, and also uh, Ross, who's now in Leiden University. He did a lot of work on the, on the synthetic work on the MNT complexes as well and some funding agents.